John, UCLA and USC are moving to the Big Ten, raising the question. Why would they do that? Why would they do that, Brian Windhorst? Money, of course, and the professionalization of college sports. It's been happening for a while, but it's finally here. Now it's like the Wild West out there. John, let's try to figure out what's next. Ads. League executives are wondering what the heck it means. And we're back. The Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast presented by U.S. Track and Field. John Oran, the business reporter for the Sports Business Journal. And I'm Andrew Marshan, the sports media columnist for the New York Post. Uh, John, last week, David Levy filling in for me. I was on vacation. Great job. The best thing was most like, I mean, to me at least, and to a lot of people who, who, who listen, he basically agreed with much of what I say. I didn't pick up on that at all, a- Andrew. We're, 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 that's going to be a topic. We're going to dissect some of uh, what, what, what David said, but I'm, I'm glad you're back. You're tan and rested from vacation. Welcome back, man. All right. Thanks, man. Remember, we appreciate you finding us. If you want, subscribe. You just hit the little follow button uh, on wherever you're watching or listening. Uh, you can also watch on YouTube. Uh, and we appreciate that. And any ratings that you give at the end of the podcast really help as well. So we start every podcast. Who's up and who's down? Who's up? Who's down? All right, Andrew, let me kick it off uh, this week. My who's up, Notre Dame Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick. Like, we're going to talk a ton today about USC and UCLA, but it is good to be the Athletic Director of Notre Dame. It's good to be Notre Dame. Everybody wants them. The Big Ten wants them. The ACC wants them. They could also decide to stay independent. Uh, there, there are a lot of questions right now. Under Notre Dame's current contract, if they're going to join a conference in football right now, it has to be the ACC because they're under that grant of rights that goes through 2036. But whatever happens, it's going to work out in Notre Dame's favor. The Big Ten is still a possibility. They could buy themselves out of the grant of rights. The ACC is still a possibility. And staying independent is still a possibility. Lots of, uh, lots of possibilities for Notre Dame. All of them look good. All right. My who's up? Fox Sports's COO, Eric Shanks, and then ESPN's chairman, uh, Jimmy Pitaro. Uh, Shanks, not a chairman. Uh, I don't know. Pitaro, he got that chairman. Shanks has been around a lot longer, but he got the uh, chairman nod. I, I don't know what's with Shanks. He, he's just like an executive producer. Like, come on. He's got to do a little bit more. No than chairman that. for him. But any, anyway, the, the reason they're up, I mean, look, some people don't like what's going on with college football. But if you're a TV entity, and that's what's driving this whole thing, are these uh, networks, specifically ESPN uh, and Fox. Uh, first, SEC, they struck with Texas and Oklahoma, and now uh, the Big Ten adds UCLA and USC. You look at what they're doing. Now, I don't know if we're going to get to a NFL junior. I mean, a lot of people are kind of saying that's the track. I'm not sure about that. We'll get into why I think that that may not happen. Uh, but... Uh, when you look at where this is going and you look at the power of football, right? We know that the NFL is number one, college football could be two in terms of importance. Uh, ESPN and Fox are going to lock up uh, deals for a long, long time. Um, and there could be other, we're getting to it. There could be other entities and there will be other entities involved with the big 10. They are both in tremendous position in terms of college football. And so I think it's good to be both of those guys. I'm just going to go right into who's down. You have Eric Shanks as who's up. I have Eric Shanks as who's down. In a couple of weeks, Major League Baseball is going to have its all-star game. What do you call an all-star game if it doesn't have any all-stars, Andrew? Uh, The amount of of primo baseball players that are on the disabled list, I'm not sure if this is setting any kind of record, but there are a lot of them. There's Bryce Harper, Mookie Betts, uh, Jacob DeGrom, um, Max, Max Scherzer, Chris Sale, uh, you know, uh, I guess Manny Machado has some problems with his, with his ankle. I, we don't know if he's actually going to play in the all-star game. You know, baseball has had a lot of things starting out, uh, with the labor dispute that, that, that early in the season, and they just can't catch a break. They have some good, fun, young players. They have a, a showcase in Los Angeles where they can really uh, uh, get the, get people to know them. 
and they're not going to be there. So I, I have Eric Shanks and the All-Star game with no All-Stars as my who's down. There will be an Oriole there, though, I believe, won't there, John? Uh, well, it should be Ashley Rushman, right? No, it's uh, actually, it's going to be Austin Hayes. I, uh, Ashley is a future All-Star. Austin Hayes is a current one. The question is, how many people listening to this pod know who those people are? Are we going to have a, 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 a Orioles topic? That's going to be probably topic number six uh, on the rundown. <laughs> how many people that's, that, the problem. Right that's the problem for baseball. Is that how many people know who those people are? Um, Aaron Judge does figure to be there, so that should help uh, Shanks and company. And Fox. always bring up the Yankees. Oh, oh, they're kind of a big deal. And let's bring up the Yankees, because my who's down is the commissioner of Major League Baseball, Rob Manfred. Now, I defend MLB. I think they're much more popular and well-positioned uh, than people think. But what just happened on July 4th is basically inexcusable. How do you have the Yankees, the Phillies, the Angels, and the Pirates not playing on July 4th? It's, it's just, to me, you look at the 162-game schedule, and when you're, it's a ton of sport, you're not going to have that many showcase days. But to me, growing up, you just think of July 4th, you think of baseball, you think of putting a game on uh, in New York. The Mets weren't on until the evening. The Yankees didn't play. They should be owning this. How, when they, they have all these deals. Now, I know ESPN, for example, has Wimbledon, but you have agreements with Turner. Why not make something special on July 4th? Why not try to create a Field of Dreams type game that comes on every July 4th and own this day? Because regular season baseball doesn't really own days. There's not, there's basically opening day and that's it. Maybe the last day of the season, if, if there's things are going on and things happen where they own days because there's no hitters and there's three home runs and all that kind of stuff and great catches and all that stuff. But in terms of just owning a day, they should own July 4th. So that's number one. That's like where they should be. And this is baseball's problem. That's where they should be. Uh, instead, we're talking about the fact that they, the most marquee team uh in baseball who's has the best record in baseball is not playing on july 4th it's ridiculous yeah and i i, I couldn't agree with you more and it, if you look at other leagues uh you know basketball with christmas day the nhl on uh, january 1st did the it's a, a outdoor game the, the winter classic and started to take that, that that day away from college football i mean this is uh the, the nfl on thanksgiving day it's a basic uh, uh scheduling pattern that's out there and to actually have teams that aren't playing on on july 4th is uh just unthinkable really and, and the thing is, you know, a lot of these things, you know, we talk about this all the time and this is what we pride ourselves in this podcast. I like to make calls like, hey, why did that happen? Right. So I just came back from vacation and, you know, we're recording this the day after July 4th. I didn't make any calls on this. Right. There's nothing they could say that I'd be like, OK, that makes sense. Like, yeah, the Yankees play 20 days in a row. So it's like the way it works. I, I, if it's still as it was when I covered in the CBA, you know, if you had three weeks, you can't play more than three weeks in a row without a day off. And maybe it was impossible to make the schedule so that they often come on July 4th. That's not a good enough reason, even if that were the case. Make it so they have a day. Figure it out. You have to figure it out. All the teams should be playing on uh, July 4th, not just the Yankees. They're just a glaring omission. If you look at the franchises in the world, sports franchises in the world, uh, they're in probably the top five, and you don't have them playing on what should be a marquee day. This inexcusable from baseball. And here in D.C., you have the Nationals. They start every game, every July 4th game at 11 a.m., and you could go from 11 a.m. all the way through the West Coast, have an entire day of baseball. So, you, you know, you come back from a parade, you turn on the TV and you're watching some baseball. It's, uh, it makes perfect sense. All right, John, when we come back, we get into the topics and the big one, the Big Ten. As UCLA and USC, we're going to get deep into it. Uh, we've both done some more reporting on it. So uh, some facts and some sourced material coming up in a moment. All right, John, let's get right into the topics. Uh, you are all over this last week, breaking story after story and, and, and really uh, giving us some great insight into what's going on with the Big Ten. They add UCLA, they add USC. Just kind of give me what your thoughts are in terms of what's going on with college football. From a media standpoint, uh, I was prepared for this week, maybe next week, to be when the uh, Big Ten announced its new media rights deal. Uh, and, and it looked like it was trending toward uh, Fox is going to get about half. You know, it, it controls the Big Ten Network, which con controls the rights. Uh, CBS was in great position 
to get that uh, early afternoon, not the noon window, but the, like the three thirty window uh, game to replace the SEC. And then you had ESPN and NBC and Amazon all angling for one other package that that was there. Hours after, probably minutes after, news broke that the USC and UCLA were coming to the Big Ten. Apple called up uh, the, the the Big Ten. I know that uh, NBC and ESPN kind of went back to the drawing board to see, so because it, it totally changes what they're going to bid for the uh, for for the Big Ten. And so the the idea that the Big Ten uh, rights deal. It, it kind of got blown up and it's going to now probably come at some point in August. It may even go past Labor Day at some point because they, there are all these new players that are coming in. And if you're somebody like, you know, like ESPN, uh, I had ESPN on the outside looking in uh, going into this week. Uh, ESPN had a plan B. Their plan B was like, all right, we don't get the Big Ten. You know, it's, it's with Fox. We're going to go then get, you know, the Pac-12 and, and, and you know, pay a lot less for it and control, uh, control a, a, you know, one of the top five major conferences. Now, if you're ESPN, you're looking at the Pac-12, it, 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 the Pac-12 without the L.A. market, without two of its top two schools and in, in terms of, uh, of brands and in terms of uh, a football history, but certainly two of the top four schools in, in, in the conference are leaving. The Pac-12 is not nearly as attractive a target for ESPN or NBC or Amazon as it was. And so now everybody's looking back in. This is going to raise the price of what the Big Ten was going to get by, I I don't even want to throw a number out there because people are now uh, more intent on trying to get Big Ten rights uh, than they were. It's it's much more important now to get them. This became, it was already a big uh, rights deal. It became much bigger. Okay, so John, I gave Shanks my who's up. So let's see what Fox did and why I like what they did, right? They're not going to, They, I think it's almost impossible to imagine that their Pac-12 is going to stay on Fox Sports after this, right? After they take their two best teams. So they say, we get rid of that deal. We don't have, we don't have the Pac-12, but we're going to take the two most important teams and universities in the conference and bring them over to our big 10 deal, which we have ownership in the network, which we have a say at the table about what everyone else is going to pay. And we kind of hold a lot of the cards there. And now we have the LA market um, on lockdown um, and we don't need all these other teams. And you wouldn't really want in terms of TV, nothing against these universities, you wouldn't want these other teams that much. Like they they have value, but not Um, someone estimated to me how much uh, value that the Pac-12 lost 40% of what they're going to get in their next TV deal will be 40% less without uh, USC and UCLA. Yep, um, that, that's at the high sign, a high side of what I was hearing, but it certainly is within the ballpark. I mean, if you just do it without thinking about how good those teams are and you know, how big the LA media market is, they're losing like 20% of, of, of actual games. You know, if you, if you take out those, uh, th- th- those two markets, so the, the 40% is, you know, certainly within the mark right there. And this is kind of counters what ESPN did because there are only so many teams that change how much money these networks are going to spend. Uh, and Texas and Oklahoma are two teams that the SEC brought in that, again, another another source said uh, the Big 12, when they lost Texas and Oklahoma, lost 50% of their value. So now they're all scrambling, trying to add teams but there's no Texas, there's no Oklahoma, there's no um, UCLA and USC really available, except for one, <laughs> Notre Dame, of course, who is the granddaddy of them all, if any conference could bring them in, and they're probably one day ticketed for the Big Ten, I would say. There's no other teams that are really like that. I do think that the Big Ten uh, may have had some interest, from what I've heard, in Cal and Stanford, but although obviously those are amazing universities and they're pretty good uh, many years at football and, and, and sometimes good at basketball as well. Uh, they just, they're not in that, le- that level that UCLA and U- USC are. There are no other teams out there that, that, that drive that interest in the Pac-12, I'm assuming you mean. In the Pac-12, I mean, you have Clemson and North Carolina. I mean, look, there are teams that could move, but how many big... Uh, well, you mentioned Clemson and Carolina, uh, certainly. Uh, Florida State is uh, somebody that, that's been mentioned. 
Uh, I think you, you think the Big Ten. So what I was told, I don't know about Clemson and Florida State for the Big Ten. No, 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 no. Ten, Clemson and Florida State would be for the SEC. Okay, got it. Yeah, so I was talking more. Yeah, you're right. So I was talking more Big Ten at this point. You know, in our pre-meeting, you mentioned NC maybe for UNC uh, for the Big Ten. But do they want to lose that Duke UNC rivalry? I guess they could still play, but they gain, and, they'll they'll gain a lot of a lot of other rivalries uh, there as well. Um, I think that you have uh, Carolina. I think Virginia is a possibility. Those are sort of two big schools that that fit uh, what the Big Ten is in, in terms of like you know big public universities. But the problem with these schools, though, John, is that the rights they're not worth as much as UCLA and USC, from what I understand, in terms of coming in. And so, you know, if you're you, if you're not, are you going to split the pie unevenly? When you start bringing in other members, like, well, teams, will universities jump. Um, we're talking about college sports right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a profession. Not, not anymore. No, we have, we have NIL. Now we have these super conferences. I can, yeah, these, uh, this is not uh, amateur athletics at, at all. But like, let's say like in North Carolina, right. Which obviously has one of the great basketball programs of all time, but this is more about football. Right. And they, they, they've had um, some good teams over the years, but they're not necessarily, you know, they're not, competing for national championships they're not worth as much so if they went to let's say the big 10 i don't know if the big 10 is going to want them as much because unless they're willing to take less money out of the deals which gets complicated because then north carolina looks at rutgers or maryland and who aren't maybe as valuable and they say well no they're getting a full share we should get a full share so that's where it gets complicated when you talk about this junior nfl thing where it's like two leagues um I'm not sure that's going to work because I don't know if the teams are going to want to split up all that money. Well, and, and that's a big, big, big thing. You're going to need teams that are going to be able to bring in that money. And so like you have North Carolina, which takes like it, it, the, the, the whole like area of a of tobacco road. I mean, that's a big TV market. It's not LA, but it's still a big TV market. And you can even look at the LA market. UCLA and USC are great for the big 10 uh, from a business standpoint, no doubt, they're they're not going to command more than a UVA or or a UNC at, 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 at within the Big Ten. I don't I don't see that at all. I think the main thing that's probably hurting uh, the UNC and UVA are the grant of rights uh, that that they signed for to to stick with the uh, the ACC, and uh, uh, that goes through twenty thirty six. And with the with the grant of rights, they would have to pay through the end of twenty thirty six whatever they would be getting in, term, uh, in terms of a, a rights fee. So it's, it's going to be a big amount of money. I know when Maryland left the ACC to go to the Big Ten, they were able to negotiate that down a little bit, not a ton, but it was still a, an expensive out uh, in, in order to have a, one of those ACC schools go to the Big Ten. Yeah, and something we try to do on the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast is kind of tell the stories before they happen, the trends that are happening. And we've been talking about this, and something I think you you first mentioned, then we talked about a lot, was the idea of a triple header on Saturdays um, with the Big Ten. Now, there, there's always been triple headers. I mean, they have games all day and, you know, largely on ESPN and Fox. Um, but the idea of a marquee triple header where you have uh, Fox with that big noon kickoff, possibly CBS at 3.30, and then a primetime game, maybe NBC um, or ABC, ESPN or Amazon involved. This, adding these two LA teams, which adds 13 to 14 games. I know there's some some people have written that there's 26 extra games. It's actually 13 to 14 because they only play, they play another team. So they added 13, but that's a lot of inventory. So you add 13 and 14 games of, again, it depends if UCLA and USC are actually good, you know, how marquee they are, but if they are good, you're adding major marquee, uh, especially with Lincoln Riley and USC, they might get better. The idea of that kind of triple header happening to me seems a little realer than it did when we were first talking about it a few weeks ago. Well, why was ESPN on the outside looking in? Because they, they were taking a look at what the third pick would be. And on occasion, the third pick would be, you know, Ohio State, maybe at Maryland. And you, you pray that Maryland keeps it close through halftime, you know, or, or they, they. Well, you do. Nobody, you know, nobody else cares. Oh, I'm betting on Maryland. The problem is nobody cares. That's we're the winning it this time. This time we're winning it. The problem is that um, there, there just weren't that many quality games. You bring in UCLA and USC and all of a sudden, like 
who are they, whoever they're playing is going, is going, that just adds that much more quality games to make that third game for a triple header, a lot much more enticing uh, for, for these networks. And it's not necessarily because that third game is going to be UCLA. You know, it might be U UCLA versus Ohio state. That would be number one for the week. And then that, that then everything else would slide down and it's a, you, you end up with three good games. It's, this really helps out the uh, in ter terms of getting more interest from those networks because of that. Well, you had David Levy on last week, former president of Turner, who's involved in a million pro. I didn't know he's involved in like every project in the world now. Uh, so good for. By David. the way, the bio took about ten, five minutes. I mean, come on, David, you got to shed some of that stuff. At an eighth grade, I was on the. Uh, <laughs> you guys got into Amazon and Apple, and here we are again. Maybe. You're reporting that Apple uh, might get involved. Now, from my understanding, Apple really likes this MLS, um, how they have the MLS package, that they want to sell subscriptions to people. And I don't know if that's, that's not going to work with the Big Ten, I don't think. Well, the, the Apple had talks with the Big Ten early on, and they didn't go far because it became a, subscri a subscription. That's that's like the MLS their, model is what they want. Yeah, absolutely, that's part of the of, of what they're looking for, and that's not what uh, the Big Ten was was, was looking for. Do that. That. The, the major teams, the major leagues, are not going to do that in the near term. Maybe the only leagues that are going to do that are the leagues that are the, the uh, linear TV networks have passed on, you know, if, if, if you don't have but a, the money goes down, like, it, like yeah. well, honestly, it's not going to happen. That's, you know, by the you, way, that's what I mean by passing on. Like, if it's like, Oh, we'll, yes. we'll pay you, well, but you know, the league that really should do a deal with Apple. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you the league, it's not going to happen because of what just happened. I mean, this whole, where we're at is partly because the PAC 12 did so poorly. The PAC 12 could turn around Again, they're not going to do this because I know that, you know, we all know they want more exposure because that was their problem in their last deal. But if there was a league that might be positioned to do something with and be able to raise their rights and do a deal with Apple, it's the Pac-12. Not going to have. Yeah, let's talk about the Pac-12. Just before we came on, they put out a statement saying that, you know, they're starting their next media rights negotiations right now. Uh, which is How like, that work? I don't know. <laughs> I'm starting my next salary negotiation right now, I guess. Well, right? Not only that, but but I may or may not like give you my best stuff. I may be, you know what I mean? Like that's basically, you don't know is Oregon going to be gonna there. Stick around. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What, 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 what am I paying for? Yeah. So, I mean, I get, the, I thought about it. I tweeted that something to that effect and I thought about it and I'm sure the, any contract they did would be under the provision that we have these teams. Here's one deal. And here's a deal. If we don't have those teams. Uh, well, certainly, but I, who would enter into that, into that contract? There, there are two. Well, the thing is, then you can tell an Arizona or an Arizona state, this is how much money you're going to get from us. You know what I mean? Like you can kind of direct them to like, to show them what they're, give them an alternative. Cause right now, you know, uh, and by the time, people, you know, it's going fast and stuff, um, you know, people can leave uh, and they kind of know what they're going to get. If there's already a TV deal in place, the PAC 12 and the big 12 um, don't really have deals in place. So you don't know how much money you're going to get in those situ situations. I can't imagine a, uh, a a major network that is going to embark in serious negotiations right now for the Pac-12, unless unless they get it for a bargain basement price. Or like, again, these are the teams that are going to be in, and then it changes. Well, Arizona leaves. Okay, we take out this much money. I mean, that's the only way you could. Really Which is, by the way, how, how every network does every single college deal anyway. There's always a mathematical formula. If you add teams, we pay, we pay you X amount more. If teams leave, we pay you X amount less. But will these teams be able to compete, right, with NIL? And, I mean, because NIL kind of changes things. I, I honestly think, obviously, we're going to have, uh, you know, Nick Saban said something out loud that I was told, like, six months ago by a prominent sports media agent that Texas A&M like for whatever reason an nil was going to dominate and get the most players i don't know why that is exactly i mean i guess there's a lot of texans who went there who have a lot of money uh who want to put but i don't understand why other you know uh universities franchises we should call them now uh universities can't do that as well the dominant teams might shift right like so i you know what we know today might be different three five years down the road depending on where the nil stuff goes yeah i think that a lot of nil is predicated on uh, on television exposure and you you have why it's not really it's private money well it's private money but how do you get to know these people 
Yeah, I guess. But I really, I mean, it strikes me that boosters are going to be like, I want this guy on our team. I want this top high school quarterback on our team. I'm going to, I'll pay $2 million to have that kid come to, you know, Texas or Oklahoma or UCLA. Isn't that, I mean, it's not really an investment, right? Like, I mean, I'm sure some of them, you know, local diner is, you know, paying, you know, going to give free dinners to the offensive line all year or whatever that is. Yeah. That's kind of to get some people in. Sure. But like, Gatorade is that really an investment or like I don't know maybe I don't know well I, I think that the one of the things of uh, the SEC and the Big Ten is a, it's a way to figure out how to deal with NIL in a way that the uh, NCAA has been completely incapable of, of of setting some any any kind of guidelines right now and so this is you know the the commissioners of those two conferences just saying like okay we're going to build we're going to be the top two conferences so the power five is now the, the power two and, and, and we're, we're going to, you know, set up the rules that, that we need to in order to maintain these conferences as, as being the biggest and the best. And hey, listen, let's get back to Amazon and Apple. All right. And let's bring Levy back into this conversation. Oh, I knew you were going to do this. You're going to play that clip, aren't you? <laughs> David Levy, you <laughs> ask him whose strategy you like Chris better. Chris Mason, I do not want to hear this clip. I do not want to hear it. Chris Mason, our ab- absolutely fantastic producer. Uh, <laughs> we'll play it, all right? And you're going to hear it right now. Amazon or Apple, David Levy, longtime TV executive, ran Turner, ran Turner Sports, has a million projects now, sports genius, et cetera. Who do you think has a better strategy right now? I bet on Amazon. I think Amazon is going to be a real player in the sports business from a global perspective and from a U.S. perspective. Um, I think they have the, a large reach vehicles. I think they have a tremendous amount of data information about goods and services that people buy. I think they can target ads. They can target uh, content to the right people at the right time. Uh, big, big, big proponent of Amazon. And of course, uh, I'm hoping that one championship does a great job there. Uh, you know what what uh, Levy did not say in that clip? He just did a deal for his MMA group with an MMA client with Amazon. Of course, he's going to say Amazon. He loves them now. I, I did notice that when I was listening to that <laughs> riding my bike on the beach, I heard, I said, hey, you know what? He might not be the most unbiased. However, when you look at it, I will say the Big Ten does fit very well in Amazon's plans. When If you're Amazon, we talked about it, how they're going for the, the biggest sports, Yankees, NFL, around the world, critic and soccer. If they could say we have Thursday night football, we have Saturday night, Big Ten, or, you know, Saturday, Big Ten. Uh, you see how there's a strategy here. Yankees on Fridays during the regular season in New York, uh, you know, uh, area. That fits really nicely for Amazon. That really makes a lot of sense to me. Here's what I'm looking for with Amazon. And, I, and you know, I, the, the F1 deal was so instructive to me. If Amazon is going after a property right now that linear broadcast networks want, it, 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 what did Levy say? They, they would have to double the payment and they're not doing that yet. They're, they're not able to convince any of these properties to, to go with them if, if they have a legitimate bid from, uh, from, from a, a traditional uh, TV company. I'm really interested to see what happens. Could the Big Ten be the first time that that they grab some rights that linear TV companies want? Uh, you've reported, I, I've got confirmed, they put in a big bid for the Big Ten. You thought it was a, a, a bid that was big enough. To- I said probably, I said probably. Probably, you did. And, we have and, a wild card. And it was a, it was a big bid. I do know that there's a lot of angst. There's some angst within the universities about whether to, to give up all the exposure that comes from um, uh, linear television to go to Amazon. What's making that angst a little less is that ESPN is demanding uh, some rights for ESPN plus. NBC is demanding a lot of rights for Peacock. Uh, I'm not quite sure what uh, uh, CBS and Paramount plus are. There there are gonna be big 10 rights that are going to streaming. And the question is whether or not they're gonna be streaming that's associated with linear TV companies or whether it's going to be streaming a la Amazon. And let's just get, before we move on from this topic, Apple. So you think that they're really involved? Um, you know, I'm reading uh, Trip Mickle's book, uh, After Steve, the After Steve Jobs book, and, uh, you know, trying to learn some things. Have, have you gotten to the uh, acknowledgments of that book yet? 
I have not gotten to the acknowledgments, but I did learn this, which I maybe, you know, probably a lot of people already knew this. I just don't know that much about uh, the inner workings of Apple. Tim Cook, Auburn, big college football guy. And I guess you say, well, that's, you know, obviously it's one of the great companies, but that stuff does sometimes play into these things. You know, Tim Cook likes football. And so maybe, you know, Apple's involved. Why do you think ESPN went after soccer so hard when John Skipper was uh, the president there? Absolutely. And Skipper, one of the more important, I'll give Skipper props for soccer, did a great job with that. Um, one of the more important people in U.S. soccer history, I would say, you got to put him like if you did like a top 100 most important people in U.S. soccer history, John Skipper's probably in that top 50, I would say. Um, and, uh, by the way, it's not only Tim Cook, Eddie Q has courtside seats to the Warriors games. I uh, I spoke to uh, Eddie Q the day after the uh, Warriors won the championship for the MLS deal. We were on a Zoom call. And I referenced it and he put his arms in the air and he, you know, to let out a cheer. Like he's a big fan, man. All right. Well, I'm not up to that. His fan. His, I haven't gotten to that part yet. So I got to find <laughs> out what we like. I just got, I'm just starting to, that uh, Cook is a big uh, college football guy. But do you think, so you're saying Apple though would do like more of a traditional deal? Cause I don't, I, again, I don't want to say it's not going to happen, but I got told by someone that uh, probably not. I think Apple wanted to re-engage to, to see if uh, they, they could, uh, it was going to be worth throwing more money in it. I don't think that Apple's strategy as it pertains to video uh, resonates with the, the, the Big Ten. So unless they change that. Well, why would you do that if you're them? You're getting so much money. You're going to get a billion dollars. Yeah, like, exactly. Like two billion. All right. You want to double what we're going to get? Then maybe we try this. Which I actually like. I mean, I'm not against. I, I I've told you. I don't know if MLS is going to work. Product's got to be better. I do think that uh, um, the the idea of selling subscriptions can work for these leagues around the world. Look, people have talked a, a lot about like the iTunes of sports. You know, if you take a look at the um, uh, out of market packages, like if you just want to buy a game for 99 cents, you know, do the iTunes model. Like that that's something that it, that is available. Uh, that that Apple could could do, you know, and it might work, but ESPN, Fox, the others, especially with the NFL, did a good job of boxing them out. I think that's kind of lost in like when people who aren't as engaged in this as maybe we are. Um, it's like they're kind of boxed out for a while, right? Like they're not just. And that's they might why, be. That's why the Big Ten is so important to me because it's it is uh, until you get to well, the NBA. You know the deal that I think actually I was thinking about this when I was on vacation. The deal that I think is the most important. You want it for the future of digital is the Sunday ticket slash being in business with NFL media. And if I'm Apple or Amazon, I'm not saying I'd pay whatever, but I honestly think when you look at the future, someone's going to have a relationship with the NFL for the long term. And Amazon already has a relationship. Um, but to have that relationship where things might go, I think that's going to be worth a lot because we all know that's the most important real estate there is. And I think that deal, it's a big deal to a lot of people. We hear about Sunday ticket. Where's it going? What's, what's going to happen with Sunday ticket? It's a big deal in the near term for those people who have it. But I think in the long term relationships, where this is going, we may look back at it one day. I want to do like the Winhurst thing. Okay. <laughs> Can you play that for me? Maybe. Wait, I still have no idea what Winhurst was talking about. I, I still have no clue. Right, we'll get to that in a second. But <laughs> what does it all mean? <laughs> I don't know. Well, on YouTube, I got the fingers up. All right. By the time this is out, it's old. But, but anyways, the... Um, but what does it all mean? I just think that if I'm following media, I'm paying very close attention to what's going on uh, in New York, uh, Park Avenue, and what the NFL is going to do with Sunday Ticket, and who are they going to have this big relationship with uh, going forward, and what that will mean for the future. Because if you're Apple and you ever really wanted to sell the NFL in an iTunes-like uh, store, you better get involved with them now. Uh, you know, because they're not just going to jump into it. They're going to have to feel comfortable with you in 10 years um, to, to do such a deal. And um, I'm not saying that will ever happen. NFL is getting so much money. Why do they want to risk that? Uh, but you think about 100 million people watch the Super Bowl. You know, like if you could just turn 50 million people paying you $10 a month, uh, it, it adds up. But again, they're getting so much money, maybe it doesn't. But that, that, that's the deal that I, I would say, what is going on in Utah? That's yeah. my what is going on in Utah. <laughs> I, I largely agree with you. Uh, where I disagree with you is that uh, DirecTV has had Sunday ticket since, since its inception, 1994. That's what, 10, 20, uh, like almost 30 years. 
they they they, they never added to that with and and they wanted to they wanted ownership stakes in in, in NFL Network they wanted to, to 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 get some sort of stake in in uh you know over the years in NFL media it never really developed that way this is a package and the the NFL is selling a package along with the, the rights to you know some declining cable channels like NFL Network and and, uh, and Red Zone so uh, I see where you, where you would say that I think that it could potentially be true. But past history suggests that, you know, it's just it's just a, a simple rights deal. I want to hit some quick hitters on this subject before um, we take a quick break and go to call of the week. Uh, first off, Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, you know, Apple, Amazon, ESPN, Paramount, Peacock, everybody. Um Warner Brothers Discovery, though, they don't seem like they're involved. This is one of my freezing cold takes right right here. I, I thought. David Zaslov is a big sports fan. David Zaslov had been running Discovery and built up Eurosport and, and Discovery Sports over in, in Europe. And David Zaslov, as the, uh, the person that's running uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, just hasn't been active. They've, they, they haven't been active in, in, in the Big Ten talks. They weren't really active in uh, Formula One talks. Uh, that's not what I expected uh, with them. When, when David Zaslov was running this, uh, when just running Discovery before the, the, the merger, uh, uh, we, I would always ask him about getting into the U.S. market. And he just said, it's so mature. You can't find any deals in the, in, in the market. The sports rights uh, are, are too expensive and nobody can make money off of it. And I thought that with Warner Brothers, uh, with the Turner Networks, he would have a change of heart about that because he was already in it. And it doesn't appear that he has, Andrew. I, I'm, I'm pretty surprised by that. Interesting. All right, MLS, we've talked about their deal with Apple. That was a big topic uh, the last few weeks. Um, what's going on in terms of uh, them you know, coming to an agreement with ESPN and Fox Game of the Week and maybe MLS Cup? What's going to happen there? You know, everybody asked me about what's going on with linear TV. They got the Apple TV deal done, and they said that they were going to have some linear deals uh, to, to announce uh, from what I'm understanding, those are almost certain to happen. I don't know what the price points are going to be, but Fox not high. Uh, no, it can't be high. I, I, Fox is talking to them. ESPN's talking to them. I think both of them are going to have some sort of uh, MLS games on on their air at some point uh, moving forward. I'm not sure what it would be. Maybe a game of the week or, or, or something along those lines. I have to tell you, Andrew, if I if I were consulting those networks. Why would you help out a potential competitor in Apple? I don't know why they're doing that deal. You, uh, you MLS, you want to leave? Go leave. I think the main reason they're doing that deal is, is that they the people really like Don Garber. He's a really well-respected and well-liked commissioner. And I think that, you know, uh, Fox and ESPN want to help him out. Yeah, I mean, you're just going to be giving an ad to Apple once a week to sell subscriptions, right? Like I, again, I get it. Not that many people watch these MLS games. So maybe they're saying, well, we're really not much of an ad. Um, and maybe, but, but I don't know. Maybe you want to keep the relationship. You're right. I do think Garber is popular um, with executives and uh, that's probably helping. And that's, that's part of the deal. I mean, part of it is it's a relationship business, right? I mean, what we do is relationship business in a lot of respects and um, what, you know, these big deals, um, which sometimes amazes me, quite honestly. Or also, like if someone likes the sport, we talked about Skipper earlier. You know, Jimmy Vitar likes baseball. It's like to me, again, that could factor into your decision. I can understand it. If you're in that position, you're like, well, where do I want to be? Right? I'd like to be at a baseball game. I'd like to be at a soccer game. So perhaps you kind of lean a little bit that way. But I don't know. These are humongous decisions. I don't know if that would be in the forefront of my mind. But, but is it, what, hasn't that, that was always the biggest surprise to me as I was covering this stuff, how much people's personal interest played into uh, exactly. what, what, what came through. And it, it, it all still shocks me to this day because I pretty much know if I were running a, t, a TV sports network, we still wouldn't be showing the Orioles or the Terps. I mean, it's like, like I, it's, I don't know, John. You get that power. power. Big yeah, Ten. Power. I'd be showing Big Ten. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Last one. Um, the Olympic Channel, you broke the story no longer. What's up there? Uh, Olympic Channel in the U.S. It launched back in 2017. Uh, NBC is shutting it down as of September 1st uh, for, for that Olympic programming. Most of it was reruns. Uh, I, you're going to end up seeing most of it, almost all of it migrate over to uh, 
uh, Peacock. I'm sure some of the swimming uh, competitions might find a home on USA. Uh, NBC hasn't announced anything uh, like that yet, but you can see uh, it was just seven, eight months ago, NBC shut down NBCSN. Now they shut down the Olympic Channel. They're putting all of their eggs behind the, the streaming service, Peacock. Hey, Andrew, since we're uh, doing quick hitters, I was on a radio show in North Carolina with a Maryland grad, Adam Gold, and he asked me this question. Marshan and RN Sports Media Podcast is a regular stop for me, uh, not only because we get great information there, but it's also uh, a time where Andrew takes shots at my friend John Oran from the Sports Business Journal, and he joins us on the Adam Gold Show. I don't know. Why do you put up with uh, with Andrew Marshan's constant barbs at your expense? I'm just going to give it to you. How should I have answered that? I mean, look, I know... Uh, just from being on vacation, that the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast is a big conversation point on sports radio around the country. And like, oh, you know, should Oran punch Marshan in the nose? <laughs> uh, how's your react? A lot of people, North Carolina, that's a big, that's a big topic of conversation. Uh, how you should respond to my uh, digs. Um, listen, you uh, take them well, you, you laugh at them. So it makes it good. And you dig back a little. Oh, you know what? I know how to play the victim. I know how to play the victim. That was good. I'm though. very effective. Like you get publicity uh, for the Marjan <laughs> Oran Sports Media Podcast. All right, call of the week after uh, we hear from our sponsor. Call of the week, John. For me, Hank Goldberg. I I lived a few years on uh, elementary school, going into middle school in Miami. Hank Goldberg. Uh, I was a huge Miami Dolphin fan then. Dan Marino was my guy. Hank Goldberg. Uh, he was uh, at the top of the heap. He was the guy you listened to. If I'm not mistaken, he might have. I used to read Dolphin Digest, and he wrote a column even for Dolphin Digest. And he was the guy. Uh, and so um, uh, it's a sad news. He passed away at 82. ESPN's Jeremy Schapp did a really nice tribute. Let's just take a little sample here, a little less than a minute, of what uh, Schapp said about uh, Goldberg. Uh, and we hear from Goldberg in the clips. What was clear was that Hank Goldberg loved being Hank Goldberg. I know it's a dirty, sweaty job, but somebody's got to do it. For half a century, he was a fixture in the South Florida sports scene. I heard you. Some guy called up the other night and said, oh, wait till they get up against a good club, and you poo-pooed that whole thing. Long before the NBA, NHL, and MLB came to town, Hank had already set up shop. Yes, he was a transplant from up north, New Jersey specifically, where his father had been a newspaper sports editor. But Hank was no carpetbagger or a snowbird. He was all in. And he figures to catch a lot of passes because... When the Dolphins were the only team that mattered in South Florida, Goldberg was the ultimate Dolphins insider. Remember this, there was genius at work in the selection of Marino. John, the thing that stood out about Hank Goldberg for me is, yes, he did have information. He was big um, with uh, the horses, like the bet on the, the races. But his personality came through even when he went national. When he was on ESPN, he didn't change. Um, and he was huge. And he'd be big now, too, with social media. Um, you know, if he was, you know, uh, at his height right now in the business. Um, and he just, he had a very engaging, uh, came across as I didn't know him, but came across very kind um, in terms of um, being able to poke fun of himself. Like even that clip, you couldn't see it in the clip, but he was talking about, he's like doing aerobics or something uh, during the, you know, so he, where he says somebody has to do it. Um, and so uh, we just want to pay respect to his family and to Hank Goldberg uh, for an amazing career and life um, because along with maybe Edwin Pope, um, Lebitar is probably up there now. Uh, when you look at Miami, um, and you know, there's probably others. I'm not a historian on Miami sports media, but uh, but he's one of the you know, if there's a Mount Rushmore, he's he, he's on there in uh, Miami sports media and also had a national presence. Yeah, Andrew, that was that, that was well said. I, I have nothing uh, to add to that. I just want to send my condolences to uh, to, to his family and and the, you know, the people that watched him that uh, are experiencing a loss. Yeah, we can only hope that one day, you know, people uh, think we're half as good as Hank Goldberg was on the air. His, uh, as a, I don't know if it was in that clip or not, but he, uh, his dad was a newspaper guy. 
uh, in New Jersey uh, growing up. You're a journal guy, sports business journal um, from the New York Post. And listen, we appreciate you finding the podcast, wherever you find it. If you uh, go to your wherever you're finding this and you subscribe, uh, follow. Uh, and then also, if you can give a review, uh, five stars is what we like. Uh, and then say something nice. It, it really is helpful. And we appreciate everyone who's listening. And as the podcast continues to grow, uh, we really appreciate everyone uh, listening every week. Yeah. Thanks for listening, guys.